I'm Tammy, a brown belt and coach from the UK. I joined Premium with the free seven day trial about a year ago, and I haven't regretted that once. I immediately binged on some audio content. The Discord server is worth the cost of membership alone. It's uh, a bit like entering a virtual open mat full of white to black belts from various countries. And the vibe's always friendly and respectful and helpful. I highly recommend joining BJJ Mental Models Premium. And I look forward to chatting with you in their Discord server. Those are some words from Tammy. She's one of hundreds of grapplers around the world who have leveled up their jujitsu game with BJJ Mental Models Premium. Join Premium today and you'll get the world's largest library of jiu-jitsu audio courses on strategy and tactics, plus direct coaching from black belt world champions, plus access to the most valuable online jiu-jitsu community. Your first week's free, so please check it out now at bjjmentalmodels.com or check the link in the show notes. Welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 258. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today, I'm back with a fan favorite and one of my personal favorite grapplers too, Mr. Lachlan Giles. How's it going, Lachlan? Yeah, great. How are you? I am also doing good. I'm glad that we could connect. Man, give me an update. How have things been? I mean, I think since the last time you talked, you know, you've got kids now. Submet is doing amazing. Give me the life update, man. What's been up? Yeah, two kids now. Gee, I think last time we spoke might have been midway through a lockdown in Melbourne for us. So yeah, it's very different to that. Obviously, yeah, everything's pretty much, well, it is normal now in Australia again. And yeah, just training and looking after kids so and looking after Submitter as well. So keeping very, very busy. So let's do the plug here. I mean, I think most people would agree. Look, there's a lot of really good online platforms out there, but The message that most people give me quite consistently is, look, gun to your head. If you got to choose one, it's going to be submeta. And I'd like to maybe talk a little bit about that, because I think that some of the decisions that you've made there are probably going to inform some of the things we talk about here today. But philosophically, you know, maybe tell me about it, about submeta and what makes it different and why you think it's been received so well. Yeah. I mean, I don't know why anyone would want to put the amount of time I put into it. (laughs) It's yeah, it's been a ridiculous amount of work. Oh, look, I don't know if I'm the only, I'm sure there's other people that have done this, but I kind of started it out like the first course we filmed for it was, you don't know anything about jujitsu. This is like your first eight lessons. I kind of like figured we, it'd be good to teach. And that's how I think you should kind of learn it, like a layered approach almost. Like you learn not too many details, just like a broad outline first, like very basic. These are the main positions with a very few details for each sort of um, position so people get the general idea and then I went to the next level which was you know our fundamentals or foundations program which is kind of like aimed to set you up with a bit of a game plan to some degree like again not teaching everything but I kind of approached it that you're better off like having one position that you know reasonably well than sort of like learn a little bit of everything but not be good at anything like you want to be effective you want to see that jujitsu works so you know, let's get good at these particular positions. After that, then I've got to, you know, basically film, pretty much finish filming all the intermediate level courses, which kind of lets you start to specialize. You know, if you want to work on a particular guard and you develop a full full systems around particular areas, particular guard, particular style of passing, and a bit more detail than just like a, an action reaction sort of thing, like a full system, I guess. And then beyond that, advanced content. So I think why people like it is, well, one, because it's got that, like there's a lot of content on there, obviously, like, and I'm kind of at the moment spending a lot of time filling out that advanced content, you know, which is going to take me another five years or I don't know, maybe I'll never, (laughs) never, never be completed. That's fine. Um, But uh, just, I think it kind of how a lot of people train, you know, when you come into training, you're usually like, I'm working on a particular thing, you know, there's something in your mind and there's like a system you want to work or a particular move. And it's just an easy platform to go, okay, what does Lachlan think about this? And, you know, you can see live footage of me training from that position. You can see how I think about that position. Yeah. So, and this, you know, we're trying to gamify it. We're going to do a lot more on that, but you know, just like there's some gamified, just meaning like it's, um, you know, you've got like progress along the courses and you've got like exercises and so on as well, which kind of just test. Cause I, th- I think actually one of the things I noticed was just, I would often like go to a seminar and so I'd be like, Oh, I really like your instructional on leg locks or something. And I'd watch them. And I'm like, you're not doing it. How I said, <laughs> so 
it's kind of like a, just a little checker. Like I, I do these exercises, just go like, okay, well, this is the information you've learned. Like, let's test you. You know, how well have you received that? And obviously, if you're not getting the exercises right, I'll be like, geez, I, I need to go back and rewatch that. And I kind of encouraging people to. I think you really should watch things more than once if it's got a bit of detail in it because you're probably going to miss things. You're only going to pick it up when it's relevant. You kind of need to watch it, try it out. You have issues, you can go back and say, oh, that's the issue that he talked about that I didn't even recognize when I first went through it. Sorry, that was a big long talk. No, I think it's fantastic. Again, it kind of touches on something I was hoping to pick your brain about today. The challenge I have with a lot of online content, especially in jujitsu, is there's just so much of it right? And it can be overwhelming. There's a bit of a paradox of choice. I mean, there are incredible content libraries out there. There's no shortage of instructional info if you need it. But I think what a lot of people need at all levels is a bit of a a holding hand, someone who can kind of help them find the way down their own path. I mean, nothing is worse than, you know, you sign up for this cool new online site and you log in and there's 10,000 videos there and they're all amazing, but you kind of don't really know where to start. Whereas with Submeta, one of the things I like about it is before it even lets you go to the videos, it kind of quizzes you and tries to isolate who are you and what are you really looking for here, right? Yeah, so that's like how long they've been training. I think, I can't remember maybe what belt they are, how long they've been training. Probably asks, it may not yet, I'm not sure. I can't remember whether this has been, <laughs> it's been a while since we did it, but the plan is to ask, like, you know, are you looking to do gi, no gi? Are you doing it for MMA or like what's your reasons? Because that's going to like influence what courses are more highly suggested for you, you know. Obviously not everything, you know, if, you're, if you don't do any gi, we sh- should almost like not show you anything related to spider guard or collar sleeve guard or anything like that. So that's, I don't think we're, it might be partially at that level, but we're, that's something that's going to be implemented. So Last time I logged in, it did ask me to admit that my guard sucks. So it's definitely doing something. I had to, you've got a database somewhere where it is on file that my guard is just absolute trash. It's got a percentage, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the reason I want to talk to you about this is this is a pattern I've noticed with your content that I think is extraordinarily unique. When you engage on Reddit, when you post on Instagram, one of the things that I love that you do is you just straight up quiz your listenership sometimes. You'll give them homework. And I love that. I'm always afraid to answer because I'm terrified I'm going to get it wrong and no one's going to want to listen to me talk anymore. (laughs) But I love that interactive nature. And I think that bleeds through onto your platform as well. And I think that in general, this solves kind of a philosophical problem that a lot of grapplers have, which is taking ownership of their own training, right? A platform and a toolkit that helps people take ownership of their own journey and have some steering correction on that, I think is so key. We had Robert Drysdale on the podcast a while ago, and he was talking about how one of the big struggles he has as an instructor today is a lot of students expect him to just kind of have all the answers. And his philosophy is that like he can be a facilitator and a coach, but at the end of the day, you as a student have to own your own jujitsu journey You have to structure your training to some extent on your own. You've got to take ownership of it. You've got to self-organize, basically. And I know that influences a lot of your thinking as well. So I would love to pick your brain on that and whether that's kind of a core philosophy that you unpack, both at Submeta and at the gym and for your own training as well. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I definitely think pretty much everyone I know that got good fast kind of took ownership and you'd see them. I mean, I I don't want to annoy too many coaches out there, but... (laughs) A lot of people that I see that got good quickly, they weren't always playing the same game that their coach was playing. They were often like looking at other sources. You know, I remember like back in the day, some of my best training partners who were really good too. They, they made it to ADCC. They're not competing anymore, but like they, they were on MG in action, you know, watching Marcelo kind of before anyone even really knew what it was and they improved so quick. They come in, they're working X guard and butterfly guard, but yeah, just like people who are self-directed like that and i think that's so important more it's it's like possibly the most important thing about improving rapidly in jiu-jitsu i think is just someone taking ownership uh, making sure they're studying and paying attention to what's working what isn't and troubleshooting and i think actually having a good training partner is is key for this as well because probably most of these people that i'm thinking of as well they usually had like one or two people that they would always work with just like they'd just be sitting there workshopping with and i think if you don't have that that's going to be a real struggle but yeah i mean it's something i've spoken to a few you know i was speaking to someone very recently who was training with us just from overseas and they were saying they came and trained with us there's a lot of time to kind of workshop your own things we've got a lot of open mats like even in class you can workshop things i'll, I'll tend to bounce ideas off different people in the gym just i don't go like i have all the answers i'm like this is how i do it but how do you You might ask another black belt how do you approach this situation but this person was saying that in their training they were kind of stuck like they could only do classes they were 
there's almost no open mats and they didn't have any time to work their own thing really, which I think is going to be very detrimental to development. Yeah, I would agree. Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny because I think people sometimes come into jujitsu with preconceived notions about how martial arts training should look. I was guilty of this, right? When I started jujitsu, I'd never done a combat sport before in my life. I started it because I've always wanted to do a martial art. I watched UFC. I saw Hoist Gracie. The rest is history, right? But I didn't know what I was getting into. In my mind, I, you know, everything I knew about martial arts, I knew from watching old kung fu movies, right? So I had this kind of perception that you've got this guru of an instructor who knows everything and they just disseminate the knowledge down to you. And if you do the drill 10,000 times, you're going to be an amazing grandmaster. And of course, we know that that is not the case, right? And I think that sometimes people do still to this day in a lot of gyms and even some very good gyms, honestly, people still do have that expectation that they're instructor is the decision maker in the class look yeah i think it is a hard one because at the same often you know your coach can give you a simple tip that saves you a hell of a lot of time <laughs> with troubleshooting i mean there's been things even for me like just i'd like i use a lot of baron bolos and so on it, it's part of my game and like training with levi there's been some things that he's either said or that i've noticed i'm like you do this and then i'm like let me try that, you know, and I'll use the thing he's been doing and it solves a problem that I never figured out myself, you know, despite doing the same, being in the same scenario for, you know, 10 years. <laughs> um, but he's come up with a different solution that's better. So it is like, it is good to use your coach for like tips and see like how they do it. Um, but at the same time, you know, a lot of, probably most of the minor adjustments I do have come from just my own exploration of the position and finding you know, different solutions myself. So, but I think a mix is really ideal. Yeah. I would want to get your feeling on where that happy place is. I mean, you know, gamification and self-direction is not new to jujitsu. People have been talking about it for quite a while, but recently, of course, with the exploration into ecological dynamics specifically, it's starting to get linked to some science concepts, and I think it's getting a renewed focus in jiu-jitsu. And so there's a lot of people now, of course, you know, friend of the show, Greg Souders, talks all the time about he's very much like a full-in eco-believer. I know a lot of other people who just insist that they're never, ever going to do it, and I think a lot of people kind of fall in the middle. There is a lot of philosophical debates around whether that's even really, truly possible to kind of be in the middle of something like that. I mean, eco is a scientific framework, so it can't be half true, right? The idea being it's like you can't halfway believe believe in gravity. It either is or it isn't. I would want to pick your brain on kind of how you apply this and where you feel that balance point is between self-organization, figuring things out on your own. And at uh, what point do, do you as the instructor just sit down and say, put your left hand here? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, that's a big topic, isn't it? Look, I think I kind of sit, I think like the fact that people are paying attention, like I would hundred percent agree if we said the ecological approach and like, if you can train something live, I would say, yeah, do it. that's definitely something that's it. That should just even come from skill acquisition prior to the ecological dynamics sort of framework coming along. But like there's more useful information that you can attain when you're trying something live, as opposed to like against passive resistance. I'd say no resistance really. So, but that's, you know, on the other side of that, like I know a lot of people who I think are insanely good who probably athletically you wouldn't think could have achieved that have done a lot of drilling. Like I think of people like the Meow Brothers, like I've rolled with them. They are not, they, at least then, maybe they are now, but when I rolled, they weren't particularly strong, but just like, and they, but they would spend like six hours a day drilling, you know, passively. Um, things that I think a lot of people nowadays would say the way they were training was bad, but I think you've got some people who there who would not fit the character of someone you would think is going to be like a world champion level grappler and they were and is that because of their training methodology i don't know but there's definitely a lot of people who have done a lot of drilling and been very successful um so yeah there's that side of it now <laughs> but yeah it's such a, a deep topic how deep do you want to get into this <laughs> oh it's a good question i mean uh, of course it's it's not a science show and i don't want to lose anyone but i would definitely be you know if you've got some deeper knowledge there or some deeper experience i definitely want to go a little bit further if you've got anything more that you can share yeah i mean so the whole the basic like premise behind the ecological approach is that perception is direct so i mean it kind of goes against the name of your podcast actually the mental models but the idea is that there's no mental models behind the world like when we move and interact with the world we're not like you know you don't see a leg coming in front of you and go oh that's a leg and therefore i have to leg drag there's not this whole processing thing it's just like almost automated thing it's you you're immediately reacting to what's happening in front of you there's a lot of debate in 
the science world as to whether there is direct perception or not. I'd say like, so I'm not sure it's like a solved thing that ecological is correct in terms of, there's, I'd say there's a lot of debate in the world. I'd say as perception's direct, I'd say there's a lot of debate around. And that's like the basic framework that we're then building upon about how we should train. But I mean, I mostly think it seems to make a lot of sense, like the ecological approach in terms of that, that is probably for the most part how we do learn. But I don't know if that necessarily means that's how we should train, as in because we don't move using mental models, therefore we should never learn technique or practice techniques we should all just discover it all ourselves i think that's a probably a bit of a leap and i think part of it is probably true as in you should do some self-exploration but for me also there's quite a lot that you should just you know you should like studying helps a lot at least for me that's made a huge difference in my game studying competitors watching instructionals so i think that's definitely probably a, i find a mix is good but i think you're probably of the same boat from, from what i've heard yeah, I mean, my feeling is that, I mean, as far as a theory goes, and I, I'm not an expert by any means here, but as far as the concept, I fully agree with what the ecological approach is proposing. It checks out for my personal experience. I mean, I can never tell you how to do an arm bar well enough that you're just going to be able to go and bang out a black belt level arm bar just because I told you, right? At the end of the day, it's your ability to feel it with your own body to feel the resistance, to kind of get an idea of the weird variability that can happen. That's the thing that is going to ultimately move the needle in terms of you being able to do it yourself. I would never argue that conceptual thinking or mental models are a replacement for actually training. Where I think they come in handy is in terms of steering where you want to focus your training and giving us a common language that we can use, right? I mean, the most ecological person in the world they're going to still know what an omoplata is, right? And they know that because at some point we define that as a concept. And yes, it is true that I cannot just explain to you how to do an omoplata and make you an expert in it, but the shared vocabulary and understanding has some value and it gives people an idea of where to focus their time. And so I do agree with you that I think the answer is somewhere in the middle, but I think that the concept of giving students tools to take ownership of their own journey and work on things that are valuable to them is immensely important. I mean, last time you were on the podcast, you talked about um, some of your explorations into reverse classroom, which is kind of a related idea, right? You're inverting the power structure and it's no longer just about a top-down approach where the coach tells everyone what to do, but now students are expected to take a degree of ownership of their own journey. And I know that a lot of coaches they love this approach. A lot of people claim it's it's a lot of work to do, but and interestingly, a lot of students often erroneously think it's easier because they think, well, if the coach isn't teaching, what are they doing? What are they here for? But man, like providing customized, personalized coaching to a room full of people who are all doing different things and you as the coach have to be on top of that, that's hard. That's really, really hard to do. And I don't think people understand how hard it is. It's easier when you've got a <laughs> like something like submit. That was part of the reason for building it as well, like using it with um with my students. So giving them a particular topic they can study and, and it kind of come in and work does make it a bit easier. Yeah, actually, I mean, sorry, just another point I wanted to kind of raise on the training methodology and ecological. One thing I've, I think we just have to be careful of is it's pretty easy to, through self-exploration, come up with solutions that just do not scale. And I think that's why I think you really should be teaching people like at least the very, at the very minimal, like a framework to work with. I'll say of, of fundamentals or like what the major successful positions are and so on. Yeah, there's plenty of moves that I come up with. You know, I kind of try different things all the time. I come up with a new move and it works against most people. But then you realize like, I, I think it might even work all the way up to black belt. And then you try it on like a decent black belt. It's like actually easy to shut down. I just hadn't come into that high level of defense before. But you can get stuck doing, developing what I'd say is somewhat bad habits. An example might be you only pass on your knees. You know, you never stand up to pass. And that's pretty common. It used to be extremely common. And the people who kind of were ingrained doing that found it very difficult to then try to stand up to pass because when they stand up they would get swept quicker of course they're not used to it but if you kind of get past that and stand up a lot you'll actually learn to stand up to pass and realize it is actually for the most part a more effective method of passing the guard and i know like rob gray talks about in his in one of his books about tim tebow i don't know a lot about college it's an american football thing yeah <laughs> <laughs> Like he talks about, this is a guy that was amazing, I think college level, um, American football, or is that the highest? Anyway, I don't know like the structure. There's a guy that was like an up and coming superstar, but he used to pass the ball underarm instead of overhead or something. And apparently when he went to the 
the big league, it just did not scale and he didn't perform nearly as well as everyone thought. And he couldn't get over this um, this habit that he developed. And I think there's just so many of those things in jiu-jitsu that giving people a good framework to work with of like highly effective positions to work from. And then within that, there's a lot of variation in how people are going to perform it. I think that's probably, a, to me, a better approach. But like you said, no one's an I don't actually think anyone's an expert in knowing what is the best training method in jiu-jitsu. I think if you're claiming to know everything, it's, you don't think there's enough information out there that we should be claiming to know anything, everything about how to train at the moment. Yeah. I mean, I've been training jujitsu for about 15 years now, which in the grand scheme of things is pretty short. The game and the methods and everything, it seems like every few years it just gets turned on its head. I mean, the evolution of jujitsu as a martial art is pretty crazy to keep up with. My biggest challenge now as a, you know, an older guy who's juggling jobs, this thing and kids is just finding the time to cover everything because there is so much new stuff. And I mean, this is something that I know my brother has been very careful to tell people is you got to be careful assuming that you know the right answer because what was the right answer five years ago could change dramatically. All it takes is one new breakthrough where one person tries something, discovers it works, it gets repeated at the highest levels, and then next thing you know, it's the new standard, right? I mean, you yourself have invented a lot of those new standards. It's just interesting how close an eye you have to have on jujitsu as an evolution because it just moves so quickly. But I think that's still happening even you know, I think in, in at least from what I hear even in judo and so on like new trends come along I don't think that's usually moves that already exist but just like someone's using it with a slightly different setup or a different gripping sequence or sometimes even just people you know if you forget about it it comes back you know outside heel hooks I think outside heel hooks are probably not that hard to defend if you see them coming but if you think they don't work if you go oh they don't work they don't work at high level, then you probably get caught with an outside heel hook because you stop defending it when you need to. So yeah, I think there's going to be a constant ebb and flow between different techniques and new ones will come along as well. New strategies. We're already seeing it now. I think like the style that Dorian kid had that won um, the 66 division, you know, I think that's probably going to be more prevalent in ADCC, just a fast paced kind of outside the legs passing, which yeah, it's going to suck for us as we get older because that looks tired. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that is my least favorite type of person who to, to play against the kind of person who isn't necessarily trying to pass fast. They're trying to deplete my cardio fast because that's always going to be the thing that beats me. It's a very, very unpleasant style to have to defend against. And to your point, the only thing I'm sure of in jujitsu from my experience is when people start saying X and Y doesn't work. That's like a sure indication that it's time for you to start doubling down and training that thing, right? When people say ankle locks don't work, man, the first thing you should do is drop everything and start working on your ankle locks because you're going to catch a lot of people sleeping. For the most part, I agree. <laughs> Except for some weird, you know, there's some weird submissions people do that, I mean, I won't say they don't work, but like, it's probably more like something that you, you'd say to like, uh, we've got people at the gym that try to like toe hold from everywhere. Like there's just a, you're getting bare and bowler, you try and toe hold, which is a very risky move to go for. And again, this is something that'll work. This is a good example of something that will, you'll catch out like blue, purple, even the same black belts you'll even get, but you're not going to toe hold when like a very good Berambolo practitioner does it. You're just giving your back. There are some things where I think it's okay to say, as a general rule, don't do that, even though occasionally it can still work. Now, this leads into something else I wanted to ask you here while we're talking about um, self-organizing students right? For the most part, you know, it's good to give people flexibility to determine their own journey. And like you said, if you want to be really good at this, to some extent you have to. But as the coach, I mean, there are times when no matter how self-organized you want your structure to be, it might be time for you to intervene and say, look, just do X, Y, Z, just do it, right? To just kind of jump in and tell them. And I would love to know for you, where is that line? Uh, is there a point where as an instructor, you know, you're walking around the room, you see people doing things the wrong way. Is there a, a like a guidepost at which you know, okay, I now as the coach, it's time for me to step in and actually start giving direct instruction or... Because presumably, you know, there's got to be a limit. You're not just letting people struggle indefinitely. Yeah, I mean, it's mostly, at least because I've got, like, I kind of use Submeta as the framework to do that. I can kind of, like, I usually, in consultation with them, like, people actually, my students don't get, like, full access to Submeta. They just get, like, I can send them particular courses. So I kind of get to intervene that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, usually say, what do you want to work on? And they'll say, I want to work on this. And I kind of look and I'm like, I might go, yep, that's good. Or I might be like, 
No, you really need to like have a strategy from like escaping, you know, getting out of half guard. You keep getting passed through half guard. So let's work some half guard retention. And that will be the topic that I assign them. So yeah, that's, and that was actually also people almost never choose the boring stuff that's important, you know, like that, like escaping half guard. I've almost had no one come up to me like, I really want to work on getting out of when someone squashes me in half guard. But so the, there's certain topics like that. This is what you're going to work and I'm going to that that's so i can kind of direct like that so i think like things that are effective obviously like generally for me there is obviously there's moves that you don't see at a world championship level now that one day might you know you could stumble upon the next meta you know like you've got the next new move we had a guy doing the buggy choke maybe 10 years ago and i used to tell him don't do that (laughs) (laughs) this is a bullshit move you're letting him pass the side control Stop doing it. And then a few years, you know, here we are 10 years later and it's part of the (laughs) the mainstream now. So there's always things like that where it could actually turn out that they've got a really good thing. But at the same time, you know, neglecting your guard retention skills and so on to work submissions from under side control is obviously not a, not really a great use of your time. Regardless, even with the buggy choke turning out to be a real move, I still think a better use of your time would have been working your guard retention. It's a more reliable pathway. Well, let me piggyback on top of that then and ask a follow-up question here. How do you encourage students to focus on the important, boring stuff that they don't want to do? You know, you got some guy who just wants to come in and train UFC. He just wants to do flying omoplatas and stuff, but you know that really they need to be focusing on fundamental guard work. Uh, How do you steer that kind of journey for someone who, away from those shiny objects and toward the things that are more important? This would probably be a point of contention for people, but for stripes... I get people to show me like particular moves and positions just to make sure that they actually have worked it. For belts, it's purely like based on their like ability and rolling, but it's just like a way for me also just to like see how they're, they're thinking and approaching jujitsu. Like, you know, some people, I think, until they go through that process, like, you don't, they just see it like, I want them to be thinking technically about like how to do things. So I'll kind of like, you know, if I wanted someone to work their half guard retention, it would be like for your next stripe. You're going to show me like some different ways of retaining half guard. So yeah, that's, I don't like the idea of testing for belts, but I do think the process of, it's actually not even the test. It's just like making sure that they actually like, okay, I'm going to learn this because Lachlan's going to look at me and see how well I'm doing it. So like, it just makes them actually spend a bit of time to do it. The testing itself, I think is actually not really, except the only thing is that you just got to like, at least have enough pressure on them to actually, like if they go like, oh, he's not even going to look at it, then then of course they won't do it. So you got to have make them at least um, worried enough that they got to like learn it properly. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's probably something that I've seen a lot of debates about gyms that do that. But for me, for belts, no. But for like having a thing where people show you techniques and you can actually like, well, there's a bit of pressure that they actually have to do it properly. I think is a very good. And for some people, it's useless. Like they are, you already know. You got those people that like that we talked about that come in and they practice every day and they're like studying like for them it's not really needed but for probably your average person that just shows up and you know goes through the motions of the class i think it's actually quite a good process does your approach change depending on the commitment level of your student and i ask this because i mean from my own journey when i was younger single no kids discovered jiu-jitsu for the first time it completely took over my life i was spending more time at jiu-jitsu than i was at my day job i was training all the time and look when you train that much you're going to improve regardless of how good or bad your methods are just due to the sheer amount of volume of training but what i found now is as i get older my ability to train and my training time is reduced significantly And it's a lot harder to improve if you're training on a hobbyist schedule, right? If you can only come in once or twice a week, you're going to be getting a lot less than if you train six or seven times a week. And I just wonder, do you change the lens of focus depending on whether you're talking to a student who is like a full-time competitor versus someone who is just a, you know, a mom and dad hobbyist who's coming in here and there and is just trying to not suck? Like, does the approach change or is it basically the same? Yeah, like our pro training in the morning which is i mean it's not just professionals we don't have that many that <laughs> actually like professionally making money from jiu-jitsu but like it's out you know the people who are taking it seriously the classes are mostly live training probably more like a i guess you'd say it's more in the ecological realm there like it's mostly like 
specific positions and scenarios and things like that and less explicit instruction. I kind of expect those people to be coming in with already a plan on what they want to work on um, and they can potentially practice that when we do the drills or they can practice like a particular thing that I'm wanting the, the class in general to practice and a lot more just like live implementation and troubleshooting, you know, we'll do troubleshooting at the end or Q&A or questions and answers at the end of class as well. Whereas probably for your hobbyist, I feel like I kind of assume that they're not doing any watching of instructionals or anything. They're just coming in at night. So they kind of want, like, they need to get a bit of an understanding of the position that they're working, you know, how it works, what are some of the options from here. I'll always still, like, every class, even when I'll show something, I, I'll, I'll still get people to do some static drilling, not because I think they're getting good at the move, but I want them to understand more like what the goals are along the way you know like if you're if for example if you took a leg drag for example you know if the general sequence i would say is like you you need to clear the line of the foot clear the line of the knee control the upper body and then secure the path and there's obviously sometimes you can skip steps but for the most part that's what you need to do and if i just say all right guys let's go live practice leg drag or like you know try and pass around the legs and i see that they're not able to pass the guard because you're not beating the light of the foot like i think that person just needs to to drill it a little bit if you watch them drill it you'll see that they're not even think like they're like not even thinking about clearing the line of the foot you got to correct you got to fix that first like clear the line of the foot okay now you can move on so it's just like giving them an understanding of what the minor goals are on the way to the larger goal which is passing the guard so usually once i, if I look around the room I'm like yep seems like most people have got that and i'll try to put some live resistance in as quick as i can because i now see that you know there's a skill to beating the line of the foot. There's a skill to beating the line of the knee. That's something that needs to be practiced live to really understand or to, to really be able to um, achieve that against someone who's who's resisting. So That makes sense. I mean, that to me aligns with my feelings. I've always felt that dead drilling, as they call it, I mean, the value is pretty limited, but it's not zero. Where it is handy is for communicating understanding or frankly, just for building a bit of confidence. I find especially for someone who is seeing something for the very first time. Uh, and this is not even necessarily a thing about white belts. It can even be more senior belts. But if you're seeing something that just is completely alien to you, a little bit of practice just to get comfortable with the general idea and to understand the feel can be helpful. And especially if it's a beginner, to give them a bit of confidence that they can go to the next level. If you throw people into the shark tank too quickly, you run the risk of overloading them and burning them out, right? I don't go so far as to say that dead drilling has no value, but I agree with you that it's good for kind of getting your toes dipped into the water, but as soon as reasonably possible, you start turning that resistance style up and then people learn how to really do it right when you're in there with a resisting opponent which is a totally different thing yeah i mean so i've, I've had some interesting discussions right like just on, even on leg drag for example but speaking to a guy kel jones who's a he's like doing his phd in ecological approach he's a judo coach actually but he's done some jujitsu as well and i was kind of like well what would you you know how would you because he does he's, he teaches judo without showing any techniques at all i thought well, how would you like teach a leg drag for like how would you get your students to do a leg drag and he's like his response was essentially well, do you need to use a leg drag to pass like can you pass the guard without using a leg drag i said yeah you can he's like well you don't need to like you just let them find the way that they like to pass the guard but i'm like to me i'm kind of like well there are other ways but like it's kind of good to know like the leg drag is an effective way to pass the guard i don't expect my students all to do it but i would like them to explore the position train it a bit and then maybe they go oh this is actually this fits in with what i do and I can find that I, now that I know that position exists and I understand it a little bit, I'm going to look for that in live training. And I think without, I think you're going to miss, I think if you just left purely to your own, um, what emerges out of your own movements, you're going to miss quite a few things, I think. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I think what a lot of the eco people would say is they don't leave their students entirely to their own devices. They take almost like a Socratic approach where the purpose of putting in the constraints and the goalposts is to guide them towards what the lesson of the day is and what they really want to learn. So, yeah, but I don't know if that's necessarily the like the pure ecological approach is to let people find solutions that work for them. Like as soon as you start saying that oh, we want to guide you to do it this way, you're now starting to look at a particular technique as such or like a to some degree. Anyway, I think like that in the end, somewhere in the middle to me suits quite well. Yeah, it's a tricky one because on one hand, I fully acknowledge that most of the, the things I do that work are things 
I developed and practiced just on my own, right? That's where I had most of my big game development was through a more kind of self-directed ecological approach. However, I can't deny that some of the most important moments in my jujitsu journey involved an instructor walking up to me, looking at what I was doing and saying, don't do that. <laughs> you know, your hand is in the wrong spot. And they tell you that once and it's like a light bulb goes off in your head. And I think that does have value too. I mean, that kind of is different from just skill acquisition, but sometimes you just need a fresh look at things, a fresh perspective. And that I think is always going to have some value, even if it, it's not technically making you directly better at the skill, right? There is still that human layer on top of it, that relationship between the student and the coach that still does matter so much. Yeah, I agree. I think we probably have a pretty similar outlook on how this works from the sound of it. Let me ask you then. So regarding submeta specifically, I would love to know kind of how does that work and engage with, and the reason I ask this is because I know so many people who use submeta. So for those out there who are listening and are submeta subscribers already, you mentioned that you use this in your gym a lot, and I'm pretty sure that people would want to pattern whatever you're doing with your students into their own practice. So how does that work? If I train at Absolute, I show up to Lachlan's class, where does, does submeta integrate in? Is there that reverse classroom element where I have to study beforehand? Are there, is there assignments that are given out or is it just kind of like a more ad hoc thing? So yeah, I'll tend to like give people a particular topic I want them to work on. They're welcome. We're in like a intermediate, we've got, we've got like a fundamentals class, which I kind of want everyone just, you know, if you're a white belt, you're not coming in working on whatever you want. <laughs> you're going to work on the theme we've got for the day but in the intermediate and advanced classes it's if you want to work on your own thing you can and i've, go, I've given them some material that they can potentially wor uh, use for that so but i'll usually show a technique anyway or a position or a concept or whatever i'm teaching now if i'll still teach something then it's kind of a bit of time where you can either work what i was showing or work on whatever you want to we'll do live training same sort of thing you can set your own parameters around your live training or you can work like the group class thing. A lot of people, despite like I'm saying this, like, and there are some people that do at the gym that do this quite well. And I do think they're the ones that probably get better a bit quicker. Still a lot of people just, most people just show up and do what I'm showing in the class, <laughs> which is, which is okay. You know, I try to, I think that part of it as well, like I've got like a general curriculum I follow, which covers like a broad, quite broadly, like different positions of jujitsu. So if you kind of like come and do all that, you'll get your breaths and you'll, like I was saying, if you never experience the leg drag you might not realize it's actually a good move for you to do so like by coming to classes and doing what i show you'll probably get to see a large part of the landscape of what what useful movements there are available in jiu-jitsu and then but i also kind of want people to come in and hone in on their things they're working on and i think that's they're probably the people who do improve a little quicker so that's basically how it got it got it do you ever spend time doing kind of one-on-one -on -one consultations do you find you have to sit down with people and because you mentioned a few times having them kind of talk you through their game showing you specific things how much of the, your time do you have to spend on a one-on-one -on -one basis that's the thing i wonder about so much because with submeta i mean it that technically is a solution that can scale to the whole planet so i would love to know like how much of the coach's direct time has to be involved in a system like that no like yeah i mean i'd love to do more but we've got like 400 students or so so it's, it's um that's why I asked. That's a big volume. I think when you go to, that's probably, like I was saying with the stripes, like I get them to show me something. That's usually the time where like, it's like, okay, I've given you this topic to work on. Show me that you know it. If I'm happy with it, we're going to move on to something else now. So it's, that's usually like roughly every six months or so I get to kind of sit down and have a look at where they're at with their game and what they can move forward on. Obviously, like anyone at any time in class can come up and ask me questions. If they say, I really want to work this, can you? Can you give me some content on this? I'll say, sure, you know, like I'll be happy to do that too. But, um, or I can obviously look at what they're doing and trouble, obviously they'll troubleshoot with me. It's not all just like, oh, go to submit. Like, obviously I'm there. <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, help them out and, and show them if I can as well. So, but yeah, it's not like, I think if you had a small, if you had 20 students, sure, you could probably speak to each one of them and each week you could be giving them little tasks that are specific to them, but it gets a lot harder when you've got a, a much larger group of people. I think it's you know, like at the same time, like we've got, what, what I really like about it, if you ever come and visit, but we've got so many people doing different things and like bouncing ideas off each other. Like it really takes away from, you know, I try to make it so like I'm not the guy here at the top that has all the answers and everyone else just there's so many different people you can bounce ideas off, each with their own different specialty and, and so on. And that's what I think builds a, 
a really good tune. Yeah. That is the main benefit long-term of a, a self-organizing structure is you remove the need for yourself as the, the leader to be the bottleneck, right? If you look at a more traditional class approach, if you're believing that the instructor is the sole decision maker in terms of who does what and who learns what, you're introducing yourself as a bottleneck now as the instructor. And if you encounter any degree of business success, then very quickly your time is going to be spread so thin that you just simply cannot do much for every individual person. And the beauty of a self-organizing system is by giving people the tools to be autonomous and build themselves up, you create those lieutenants and domain experts in your gym who can carry on the mission even without your direct involvement, right? So that's part of the the sales pitch of such an approach is, is intended to scale better. I think a lot of people, a lot of coaches probably get a little scared about doing that. They don't want to take away some of their power and give it to someone else. And, you know, like there's this kind of, which I think is not a good mindset to have at all. But I think that's probably what happens, you know, like I know everything and no one else does. And therefore, like you have to stay with me and stay loyal and, and so on. Whereas I think, I think actually you go beyond that and you just create an environment that is great for learning. People are going to want to stay anyway. So, yeah, I'm glad you bring that up because it is hard to give other people control and power like that. I mean, there's always that feel of security, right? If I'm giving you the thing that you're paying me to come here for, what's going to keep you here? People feel that way. And it's the same thing you see it, you know, in a, in a day job where people are always thinking, well, if I just hoard all of the knowledge to myself, then I've got more job security. People think that works, but what actually happens it just becomes impossible to work with a person like that because they can't scale up their time. People wind up working around that person. And also, I mean, anyone who's ever diligently tried to climb a corporate ladder understands like you're unlikely to get a promotion unless there's someone else that you've trained who can take over the job that you were doing before, right? If you're going to grow a team, it's not just about you. You have to grow the rest of the people so that they can pick up the slack when you drop the ball and move on to something else. And one of the things that really fascinates me are these parallels. Self-organization in the business world has been a, an emerging concept for the past, I want to say, 60 years or so. I mean, in software where I work, I'd say that the majority of teams are, at least they claim to be self-organizing. Maybe they're not doing it exactly quite right or they're doing a hybrid. But it's fascinating to see that that mentality is coming to jujitsu as well. And yeah, convincing these black belts to give a bit of their power, right? A bit of their, their reputation and letting the students in the class take ownership and elevate themselves. So it's really cool to see. Yeah, it's good. I think it's like all headed that way. So it's, it's um, moving away from the more hierarchical model that uh, has been very prevalent. So yeah, it's good. It's like you said, the thing I love about jujitsu is when you walk into someone's gym and it feels like a lab, like you said, right? It's like a laboratory. There's a lot of people all very good at their thing, studying different areas. Everyone's trying to advance the sport and work together collectively. That's just such a, an amazing dynamic to have the the best rooms i've ever trained in are those rooms that feel like they're a laboratory if you come in and it feels like you're just doing what the instructor is telling you to do you're never really going to feel that sense of ownership and connection to the gym right so i think people from a cultural standpoint underestimate how important it is to have that kind of collective culture within the gym where everyone's learning and everyone has some control for sure, yeah. That's always been my experience anyway. Like the more open the environment, the more people learning, the better they get. One last thing I want to ask you, man. I mean, we've talked a lot about the student perspective, but I'm cognizant of the fact that if you are an instructor and you want to employ some degree of self-organization in your gym, it's a lot of work, especially up front. It gets better over time, but it's a lot to get rolling. I mean, you talked, for example, about all of the work involved in getting submeta uh, set up. Uh, Bruce Hoyer, I, I know you've spoken to him before. He was an early proponent of the reverse classroom model in jiu-jitsu. And when I talked to him about it, he said the hardest part was building the library of content that he needed to build to get students to the point where they could do it, right? Because you have to provide some study resources that allow these people to self-select. Now, I'd say that the one thing that's changed since then is we have submeta. And if I were a gym instructor and I wanted to deploy some degree of self-organizing structure in my school, probably the first thing I'd do 
is start with some meta and figure out, okay, is there a way that I can build on top of what's already here, right? Can I take Lachlan's system and basically deploy it within my own gym and use that as the study resource? Are you aware of anyone who's done that? Like any instructors who have basically modeled their entire framework off of some meta and have had success doing that? There are multiple people who tell me they kind of run their classes based on like, they'll watch some meta and they'll I kind of teach systems based around that. Um, yeah, it's, look, the problem is it's hard to implement the method I use, which is like I can give students particular courses and so on. It works for me. And I theoretically, I could say to another coach, like, hey, you can just hand out people courses. The problem is I'm basically giving away. I don't know how to like make it so that's still secure, you know, like if I said to a coach, yeah, you can use Submeta and give your students some of my courses, like ones that you, like, I, I don't know how I could keep that there and prevent that just being something like that they can give to anyone that's something i haven't really worked out you could tell your students to s- subscribe to submit which obviously you know they should but <laughs> um, but uh, in reality that's you know i think anything where you're asking your students to spend extra money on something is like it can't be something you require them to do you can recommend it but it's hard to um say like oh you have to do this in order to attend my classes that would not work so i just haven't worked like i'd love to have it something that does work with gyms like that i just haven't worked out a model that would be um easy to monitor and make sure it actually works well but if someone's from my own perspective there but yeah if someone wanted to do a similar thing if you want to film all the content you can (laughs) it's a lot of work if it's just for just for your own students but it could be worth it still like it's you know it's a hell of a lot of work but it's i think it's a good way to do it other i mean another option could be like you have there's a lot of good content online on YouTube and so on. It might not be as easy to navigate or as well structured as as you know an online training website that's you know built specifically for that. But you could you know like assign students like hey like have a watch of these videos and I think this kind of thing would be good for you and and study this system or you can even give people like a, a person to study. You know like I think you should work try to pass like Nicky Ryan go and study Nicky Ryan's matches watch how he's passing the guard I want you to do that I think that would be a good way for you to train and I think that would be a way that they're kind of gonna have to do some of their own research but it's that's could be really good so yeah yeah I mean I think the beauty of a, a self-organizing approach is people do have some control so like you said I mean a lot of people are probably already going to be subscribed to submeta or would be willing to subscribe I mean the look if you look at the kind of money that people spend on jujitsu stuff right submeta is not that bad right I mean for considering how much I know people are spending on geese and instructionals and other things like that the beauty of most of these subscription models is they tend to be a dramatically better deal than just buying a one-off instructional. And they're also lower risk for a lot of customers, right? I mean, if you drop hundreds of bucks on an instructional, you watch five minutes of it and you realize you hate it, that's a pretty big loss for you. But with a subscription site, you can basically use it metered, right? You can use as much as you want when you want to. You can cancel later if you're not using it. And the beauty of a self-organizing system is students don't have to use it. It's just a recommendation. But I would say that, yeah, I mean, if I were an instructor running a self-organizing class and I had people coming to me and saying, look, I really want to kick my training up to the next level. I want to take more ownership of my approach. How do I do that? I think Submet is probably one of the better platforms to do that just due to the sheer comprehensiveness of it, right? I mean, I I can't imagine there's going to be many holes in it. Yes. Yeah. Eventually, I want to cover everything. Well, so far, I covered most things at at least intermediate level and quite a lot at an advanced level. But yeah, I agree. It's a good platform to use for those particular reasons. You're talking about subscription. I mean, yeah, it's a relative to buy. I was actually one of the things when I was setting it up was what should I charge for this? Because, you know, I can sell an instructional for 129 US dollars. Obviously, they go on discount and, and so on. But like, am I going to like, am I ripping myself off almost? Go giving away for twenty five dollars, like you know, someone could pay twenty five dollars for the month, watch the thing, and then cancel. Like, is that? But you know, when you've got enough content on there, it makes people want to stay because they say, okay, I've learned that, but now I want to focus on this, and they can go back. So, I think like subscription works well when there's a lot of different content, and it's something you're gonna want to keep. Which we're finding, you know, people who subscribe tend to stay for quite a long time, which is which is good for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we do a subscription system too, right? Our premium thing. And I've had the same experience where, yes, there are people who will try to game things like they'll sign up, they'll download everything and just binge it on their free trial and then they'll leave. But my thought is like, look, those people, they probably had reasons for doing that. I probably wasn't going to get a long term subscription anyway. It's pretty rare to most people. They appreciate the approach because it is very low risk, right? You try something and if you don't like it, you move on. If you do like it, 
it's still over the long term going to be a really good investment for and, and still probably going to be a lot cheaper than buying the equivalent volume of one-off instructionals. And as a content creator, I'm sure you felt this as well too, it really motivates you to always be doing better and making more stuff and improving your stuff because you're not just doing these one-off transactions, right? It is the onus is on you to keep the system sharp and up to date and as good as it can be at all times. And so That's the thing I love about that approach too, is it motivates me to be better because I know that people are giving me ongoing revenue to be better. Yeah. And you got someone who's subscribed and you're keeping on giving them new content. You know, a lot of people ask, when's this coming? And when's that coming? All right, I'm on to it. (laughs) So there's so much I can film in a week, but I'll, uh, yeah, constantly updating. So ideally it's something that they pay for and every month it's a better product than it was the month before because there's more on there. Well, Lachlan, if people have an extra 25 bucks that they want to spend. Where is the best place that they can go to invest in their jujitsu and work directly with one of the world's top grapplers to learn how to self-organize and be an amazing jujitsu athlete? Where would they go? Uh, Yes, I'll I'll submit her, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) We got to work on your sales pitch, man. (laughs) But yeah, Yeah. submeta.io is the address, right? I believe. Yeah, submeta.io. We've got... um... B team on there as well now, so that, that's a separate subscription. But B team's um, putting out content, so there's more like uh, less. Mine's like courses and like um, so I guess more like teaching systems. There's you get to see a lot more like it's more like narrated roles and classes being taught, and so it's a bit more like imagine you're in the training room at B team, less so than watching um, pre-filmed instructional. So you can kind of see who's doing what in the training room and, and so on too. So I just thought I'd give that a, a plug as well because that's that's coming along really well and. You get the different instructors there too. So, yeah. That's actually really cool because I love the idea of not just teaching people jujitsu stuff, but also giving them kind of like a taste of the culture and a look on the inside. Um, I've noticed a move more towards that. Um, A while ago, Rafael Lovato Jr. put out this new instructional called How to Win. And it wasn't just a technique library. It was almost like a kind of like a self-narrated documentary where he talked about some of the biggest moments in his career and what that meant to him and how he prepared and where he made mistakes. And it was just a fascinating way to learn jujitsu, right? It's more kind of biographical. And so I think it's cool that you guys are exploring that as well too and giving different looks to this because I mean, for myself, I can definitely see the appeal of kind of having an inside look at what it feels like to be in that room. I can understand why people would get a lot of value out of that. I mean, we have people from at least in Australia, just about every Australian seems to fly all the way over to Texas to go and train with them. So now you can see what's going on (laughs) from from your own home and not spend so much money anyway. Awesome. Well, I will do what I always do. I will put a link in the show notes to make it easy for people to find that stuff. So uh, if anyone wants to check it out, submeta.io, link in the show notes. Um, Of course, all of our stuff lives at bjjmentalmodels.com. There's a ton of episodes of the podcast in there, all free, over 250 at this point. Lachlan's been on a bunch of them. So (laughs) if you like Lachlan, you can check the back catalog. It's also where you can sign up for our newsletter and the premium service I talked about as well. We've got a a giant library of um, audio content on jujitsu strategy, concepts, tactics, a whole bunch of stuff there with some real incredible athletes and coaches. Plus, we also do rolling reviews. So we've got an amazing black belt review team. Got some great competitors on there like Dominica Oblanite, Mark. Marco Ciccarelli, Emily Kwok, Brianna St. Marie, um, they will review your roles if you're a premium subscriber. So join up. And if you want to get some expert review, that's how you do it. Again, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. So there you go. Two subscriptions for people to check out. But yeah, Lachlan, I, I can't thank you enough. Um, it's been awesome to see the development of Submeta as well. I just think it is an amazing resource. I love the fact that, like I said earlier, it feels like where a lot of other instructors were content to just put techniques up on a website and have like a one-way relationship with people. I feel like Submeta is got a, a level of product thinking that you tend not to see in jujitsu, right? I mean, if you told me that some Silicon Valley tech billionaire had built this thing with like a team of amazing product people, I would absolutely believe it. So a uh, big congrats to you and I appreciate everything. Thank you. Yeah, there's a lot more that we're going to be doing with the site. It's just developers take longer than, <laughs> than you'd like. So. Yeah, but that's all coming. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks a lot, buddy. I greatly appreciate it. No worries. Thank you. Thanks, man. And thanks to the listeners too. We'll talk to you next time. Take care.